My name is Ralph Simon, and it's just incredible to be here at uh, Singularity University's uh, incredible gathering. And uh, this particular session is really quite interesting and fascinating for the following reasons. Just dig this. About half a billion people, nearly 500 million people, are without access to essential health care. And most systems are structured to tackle diseases rather than manage long-term conditions like dementia, cancer, and chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. So basically, globally, there's a wide, wide recognition that what we have to do is we've got to concentrate on transforming the practice of medicine and personal health care from reactive disease detection to a position of proactive prevention through early diagnosis, through greater connectivity, and data. And data and greater connectivity, and also areas, for example, like vaccinations and inoculations, really, really important to be able to have a whole new thinking on the way this is done using modern technology. So I want to ask a question. How many of you are familiar with the Facebook, Google, Apple initiative globally called TIP? Anybody familiar with TIP? TIP is the Telecom Infra Project. This is a massive collective uh, initiative by all of the social media tech companies to bring uh, the wider internet to a much greater basis around the world, Africa, India, Asia, Pac, all over. And to start off with, what we want to do today was to introduce you to somebody who is really right at the intersection of ecology, computing and health, counterfeit and the dark web of drugs, but also someone who has got solutions to improve global health using what is referred to as full-stack data science, decision support, and immersive technologies. So before we bring on uh, Dr. Nico Preston, let me first introduce Mark Koska. Mark, come on board. Mark is all the way from Sussex in England. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, take a seat over there. Oh, there we are with your table. Mark has got something fantastic to show us. It'll be a world-breaking reveal of something that is going to completely change the face of syringes, injections, injection thinking, and injection technology. But now, let us introduce to you Dr. Nico Preston, the distinguished technologist, chief data, uh, data scientist, Nico, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you so much, Ralph. So, Appreciate Nico, it. over to you. Tell us about how the data stack is helping to bring a stack of information and clarity to the world of globalizing and democratizing health and medicine. Absolutely. Thank you. Good morning. Digital global health is the concept that we've got piles of information resulting from our digital exhaust or a digital phenotype or whatever term uh, du jour. This info is expanding, I think it fits in this exponential realm, and we have an opportunity as uh, professionals in the health community to take the pulse, the global pulse of what's going on uh, with our patients, with our communities. So the field of digital vigilance is something I'll introduce, as well as a quick tour of digital diseases and digital drugs. Within digital vigilance is the premise that, um, is it possible within this realm of information to essentially take a global medical history by following online discussions, by following news, and developing essentially a roadmap of global health concerns around the world, be they uh, epi drug epidemics, infectious disease outbreaks and pandemics, or more chronic uh, considerations uh, and issues that accompany this, this growth of uh, technologies. So within that realm, as a data scientist, the things that we find particularly challenging uh, with all of this change can be bunched into sort of the four Vs, which are characteristics of the shape of our data, that's the, the variety of sources, the volume, the veracity, you, you hear fake news everywhere we turn, as well as the velocity, the rate at which this information is flowing. But within that context, we're also struggling with a change to the fundamental network, our relationships with information, the way the information is wired together and where it lives. And ultimately, I think the challenge for us is mapping that to reality. As, as, as subject matter experts or as, as health providers, 
how do we take this digital exhaust and turn it into a, a better understanding of considerations around the world? When I talk about the web and online data, I'm giving a broad definition. I'm taking us from the surface web, which, which most of us interact in our daily lives, to the deep web, where we have siloed uh, repositories of information for a variety of reasons. Um, and also, a quick deke into the dark web where we're seeing a proliferation of narcotic sales and other types of information which aren't commonly exposed to search engines or necessarily something we as healthcare providers and professionals are, uh, are, are, are versed in. So thinking of this sort of network graph of the web up in the top left, we live within these communities, and if we're to understand the public health concerns of these communities, we have to understand how representative they are of reality. If we have people living in one realm versus another, um, are, we, are we violating all the premises of statistics of presence and absence if we don't actually know if there's an absence of disease or an absence of drugs? And then how do we map that to concepts like disease emergence or spillover from wildlife or these natural processes which, which lead to uh, disease transmission dynamics and sort of the, uh, the, 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 the ingredients of a, uh, of a pandemic? So within that space is also trying to map this to the street corner. We're coping here in the US with, a, with an unparalleled crisis uh, around opioids. People are not buying drugs on the street corner, they're buying them in bulk. They're buying uh, chemicals that we have limited understanding of its chemical composition. We heard from Ray earlier in the week about the backyard chemists. This stuff is being consumed by the people we see in our clinics. When they show up with uh, chest wall rigidity, what have they been exposed to? Are we tracking these drugs? So trying to map that digital world onto the reality of how drugs circulate in our community is another of the challenges we've expanded to from the original premise of digital disease. So in terms of tracking the next academic, you heard on day one from uh, my colleague and pioneer in the field, John Brownstein, about the origins of this digital disease detection movement, the idea that we could take the global pulse by looking for the earliest signals of emerging infectious diseases, by looking at a broad range of sources. We can't stop with the web, right? We're experiencing the growth of the internet of medical things. We're seeing a, you know, the, uh, the, the role of technology in our everyday lives and the way we interact with the health system. These are data sources that we need to fuse and combine with this digital signal. While we await you know, this, this future where perhaps all of our information is accessible for our healthcare providers, we have to rely on, on these surrogates or on these weaker signals from the digital realm to understand how they're transforming our society and creating new risks uh, for, for the people uh, for whom we care. So here's an instance of pulling information from local sources, and a critical ingredient in all of this, uh, and looking at mosquito-borne disease, for instance, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So taking that model, as, as data scientists, essentially what we do is we map out the information and we try to reduce it to some semblance of a signal or an understanding of our system. So in thinking about uh, the opioid epidemic here in the US, the numbers are astonishing. The, the drugs, we're not even sure what people are dying from. We're not testing the baggies, we're testing the bodies. And what we need to do as a community of technologists is know what drugs are showing up on the streets. Um, there's the, the proliferation uh, of opioids, we're now in its third wave, right? We can trace it back to the organic prescription wave of the 90s onto the semi-synthetics like heroin, and now these synthetics and analogs of fentanyl and other drugs. Um, you know, recent academic work in this space has been calling for uh, an expansion of harm reduction strategies and uh, evidence-based substance uh, treatment, as well as an expansion of our health surveillance capabilities. So quick image of what this looks like to those of us monitoring these sources. I mean, we, we, I mentioned ba uh, baggies, not bodies. Here's a case of counterfeit Xanax showing up in streets of San, Fran San Francisco and costing lives. You know, we can get imagery of this Xanax, but we can also find where it's being sold. So as we dive into those regions of the web where people are buying drugs uh, in bulk, we see, well, a three milligram uh, pill, and we know right away that, well, no one makes a three milligram pill. There are these little faint signals that, that something's amiss. Um, what does that world look like? Well, even in making these drugs, um, what's one of the things that makes this not our parents' epidemic is stuff show, getting shipped through the mail. People are uh, needing to uh, you know, expand these concentrated volumes that have made it easier to do so based on you know, end of life and pain uh, uh, formulations and add binders and other things. So here we see people discussing binder ratios and we don't know what we're putting in our bodies or what the impact could be. So here's a 
you know, a, a, a shopping experience with reviews and everything else uh, for, a, for someone shopping uh, for drugs online. So globally, uh, you know, we can see the proliferation of fentanyl. These, these, these pathways are connected. Uh, they bind uh, all corners of the world from production, uh, shipping, and, uh, and supply chains. But as we dive into a region like Boston, where I call home, you know, we start to line it up with syringe exchange and harm reduction and thinking about how we can intervene and interrupt uh, these dangers to people who use drugs, um, as well as lining it up and looking at pricing and trying to understand how this market functions. So, uh, to wrap that theme, I had the privilege this summer with some support from the World Food Program's Innovation Accelerator to spend time at Singularity University on a sabbatical. And it took me to thinking about this information and how it's changed, and a desire to go back to the field and start to ground truth it. So I've partnered with a good uh, friend and collaborator, Dr. Alex Kumar, who some of you may know, a physician and photographer, to look into this evolution of media and global health, uh, to combine health, water, and security, to work on building uh, analytic capacity around the world through hackathons and other mechanisms for building global uh, disease uh, uh, capability, and to bring appropriate technologies uh, to low uh, incomes settings in the world. So with that, I'll wrap Ralph and turn it over. Okay, so thank you very much. So give him a... <clears throat> so Nico, when you mentioned uh, doing your data analysis around the world, you're also doing media analysis, where you basically are mining what's seen on the web and uh, basically uh, uh, online. Um, and you're looking not just, of course, at fake news, but you're looking at trying to pick up trends from around the world as one is trying to democratize health and the approach to health, mm -hmm. you're also looking at seeing where the problem areas are that maybe then the World Health Organization with their now strong alerts in, uh, in the wake of the Ebola crisis mm -hmm. can maybe pick up and basically what you're doing with your data stacks is really acting as an info uh, clearance center to show that there's something coming up that can also aid or harm the democratization of global health. Uh, absolutely. And the the, the growth of information, these capabilities, is uneven. So in, as we saw in, in, uh, with Ebola, uh, my colleague uh, Alex Kumar was on the ground. We were scrambling trying to find information about these settings after the fact. So while we have democratization of data, it's uneven. There are regions of the world that are still dark, and we, operating in this field, need to work to sort of shine a light on these data shortages, to build out our strategic data reserves, and to plan, as well as to empower the folks on the ground, such as community health workers. So the the uh, new impetus of the World Health Organization plus ministers of health from around the world, just to give you an idea, in Africa, the African Union, which is the United Nations of Africa, has got a health minister's uh, committee, really, which basically looks at pan-African uh, uh, democratization of health. You're talking about nearly a billion people, 900 million mobile subscribers, where mobile is really proving to be a very, very important medium to get across new ways of thinking. And this is actually an interesting juncture for us to be able to bring uh, Mark Koska into light here. Um, and uh, something that uh, Mark once said over 25 years ago, at the time he said, the only thing that I'd ever manufactured was excuses. <laughs> of course, he was living a much simpler life then, but he always had the dream and the, burn, the, the, the dream, the burn inside him to become an inventor. Mark, just tell us briefly what you invented and why it was such a global changer and why it's actually acting as a fundamental catalyst for the democratization of health. Thank you. So, um, can we run the video that um, we've got loaded up? This footage uh, without sound. More than Thank you. So, here's a nurse in Tanzania. This undercover footage. She's wearing a nicely ironed uniform. She picks up the syringe off the tray. It hasn't got a cap on the needle, and she uh, gives an injection to this four-year-old child. Um, after the injection, and uh, she goes back on the tray. And the next patient is an 18-year-old. He's got HIV, and in this case, being treated for syphilis. She reads his note. She, there's an undercover camera buried in a book. It's so blunt, the needle, that it won't penetrate the skin because it's been used so many times. And um, she then gives the injection. He's actually screaming at this point because it's, she delivers so fast. He goes back on the tray, and you'll notice that it rolls slightly to the left just now towards those vials. The next patient is a one-year-old, babe in arms. She picks up the syringe from that same position and then 
injects the baby. So if you imagine that um, this is happening on a vast scale, there are billions of injections given around the world, obviously, every year. I just want to point out, though, that I don't hold, and I'm sure none of us do, any blame to this particular nurse. There's no malintention with her. That's why I mentioned the fact that she irons her uniform. She's very proud of her, her, her training and her position in the society in which she works. But the system has really let her down. Why? Because there aren't enough syringes in, 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 the, in the whole process coming with the drugs. And why would that be? Well, really, there's no in, in, intent to, to match those two together. A vaccine or, or um, antibiotic, in this case, will travel on its own without the syringe and meet about a minute or several hours before, um, before it gets injected into the patient. And it's a very weak supply line having these syringes. There's no money in syringes. They're such a low-cost item. It's almost akin to putting a straw in a Coca-Cola. You don't pay for the straw, but you pay a lot for the Coke. So having observed this several, years ago, uh, several decades ago, I went about um, setting out to make something that would be fit for purpose. So I designed a syringe that can only be used once. But the key, and there are several thousand patents on syringes that can only be used once, but the key is that this one is made on existing machinery with a very small modification for the same price and used in the same way. I'm not going to show you one today. I'm going to show you something else. But that syringe, after 17 years, I finally got it into, uh, into production and then sold it to UNICEF. And we're now the biggest supplier to UNICEF. And we've sold over 8 billion of these um, syringes and being credited with you know, stopping all those infections taking right. place. Thank you. And we should also just say that the World Health Organization have now officially mandated as official WHO policy that all syringes should be single-use only syringes. Yeah, by 2020. Okay, yep. so how many injections do you think have been given with your syringes for inoculations, vaccinations, over the last, say, eight to ten years? Well, as I said, eight billion exactly because they can't be reused. So the okay. same number as the, <laughs> the number of syringes. Okay, um, so. But I just the final bit before we segue on to the new thing is that this doesn't just happen in, in rural Africa. This was 500 miles away from Dar es Salaam, where this bit of footage, and we've got 50 of these rolls of film. You'd go in undercover, taking shots undercover, and then go to the Ministry of Health in the respective country and get the law changed. Yeah, and in that case, actually, we, I went to the, the uh, Minister of Health at the time, showed her this video. She said, it's fake, I don't believe it. So we got in a car in, and we drove for three days. We visited 17 clinics and she had to buy me dinner because not one of the clinics we went to had enough equipment to deliver for the number of patients that they were serving that day. So this is an absolutely uh, you know, terrible problem in the developing world. But as I told you earlier, um, it's not just there. In America, CDC have just published a report last week saying that 12% of all physicians in the US admit to reusing syringes every year. 12%? That's, that's impossible. Insane. And 3% are nurses. And you, you can ask why. Well, maybe they don't want to walk down the corridor to get fresh supplies. Maybe they, I don't know, you know. There's a whole host of reasons it's another talk. But. So, so sh you've now come up with a new invention which is really going to revolutionize the whole notion of syringes. And basically, this comes from the two beehives you keep at your home <laughs> in England where you were basically looking at bee activity and you used biomimicry. Tell us how you created it and then show us what you've done that is a transformative development for democratization of vaccinations. Thanks. So um, I was really um, keen to understand what the previous product had had an effect for. And if you imagine the whole long supply chain, and I mentioned earlier that syringes and vi vaccines only come together at the last minute before they're used. I, I was wondering, you know, well, this invention, several billion units, have we really changed the system? And of course we haven't, because we got statistics like the CDC one that we're hearing. And what I was really keen on doing was taking a fresh look and trying to use my experience to see whether we could change the whole supply chain from the way drugs are packaged and delivered and transported and then used on the patient. And while I was pondering this, um, true story, a bee, a honey bee, flew past uh, my eyesight, uh, my eye line, and I kind of asked the bee, what would you do? And 
<laughs> to be or not to be. To be or not oh. to be. Oh, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I thought, well, why don't we give injections like a bee sting? Now, there have been a few attempts to do this from uh, several decades ago, making little pouches with needles. But the, the manufacturing technology wasn't available to bring down the price. And of course, the goal for anything on, on this scale would have to match the price that we've got with syringes and needles. So obviously, you all know what a glass vial looks like and what a syringe looks like. This is, these are some examples. And glass vials, in, in the way I was thinking, were, uh, is something that needs to change. They're 120 years old, the first glass vials used for medicine with this rubber septum on. And they're, they're uh, delicate, they're heavy, they take a lot of energy. Believe it or not, this vial takes six months to manufacture, from the raw material processing all the way through to it being filled and sterile. Um, and going out to the market. So you've all seen these, I'm sure. These are little um, uh, bottles that contain eye drops. And actually, the, the methodology for making these is so fast that instead of six months, these take six seconds to fill. So the question was, could we put drugs in this and have the same longevity and the same protection? And we were able to do it. We've laminated this into five layers. So the outside layer has a UV protection. On the inside, it's, um, very, it's relatively um, advanced because we're using hydrophobic layer on the inside so that the drug doesn't clump and you don't have to um, shake it. And let me just show you what happens. So we've designed a range of needles. So you would, in this case, break off the device. I hope you can see it. I'll try and keep very still. Um, designed a little needle that goes onto it. And if I get this card, um, you can see here we've got our half ml vaccine, for example, and squeezing it, you're able to give the injection like that. So this suddenly is a massive game changer. This, this device is one ninth of the size of a needle and syringe. It cannot break. Uh, roughly 10% of all vials break from manufacture to end use in the supply chain. It can't break. It's very robust. We can throw them out of drones or aeroplanes. And the best news is that they're already approved for self-administration, which means in challenged areas of that system, which we just saw in the video, we're able to leap over that, health, that healthcare worker barrier because there aren't enough or they're poorly supplied. And to finish off, the, the drug is packaged with the needle at the point of manufacture so that there's no excuse for those two not to meet in the supply chain. Show us that secondary model that you've got uh, that looks like a, well, looks like the tail of a bee, really. So the other th great thing about this technology, which is called BFS, is that it's been around a long time. Uh, now, with new materials, we're able to um, store these, um, these medicines. Large molecule vaccines, for example, are completely stable in this. But they can make them in any shape you might imagine. So here's a little um, two pouches that you squeeze together. You can make them look like um, little flying saucers and, in, uh, and invert and just push that disc down and that delivers the exact dose. So pre-filled, single dose is really the way forward here because we know that we're delivering the right dose uh, with the right needle to, to the right patient. And this is going to change the way that we do uh, vaccination campaigns around the world, but also home delivery. What about the next stage of, of the way that um, you know, large companies are looking to be major distributors of, of uh, drugs in the future, and you know who I'm talking about, imagine how they're going to be able to utilize this, gain more access to the customers, and for the customers to get more access to, to the product. So drone deliveries of the kind that, for example, uh, we've seen in countries like Peru or in the Philippines or uh, all over the world, really, uh, this is a much lighter way of getting ab something absolutely essential for dealing with preventative health care. So we'd like to open up and ask yourselves, particularly those of you that are interested in this whole notion of how you democratize or you globalize uh, health uh, care and prevention, if you've got any questions that you want to ask um, Nico and uh, Mark. Uh, so if anyone has got uh, any interest in this, particularly from either an international or a uh, United States standpoint, particularly when we hear about the opioid crisis, where we hear about uh, the uh, manufacture in China of uh, fake fentanyl that really uh, creates massive problems on the street and uh, presents uh, other issues. Anybody have any comments they'd like to address to Mark and Nico? 
particularly also about data and the use of this and how it's accessible to you if you're in general practice or in specialized practice. Hi, I'm Ron Schaefer, a practicing physician from Hawaii. Um, I think your little squeeze syringe is, is wonderful. Um, but I still see a problem with the needle being separate and possibly reusing the needle. Have you thought about, you know, somehow binding the needle to the medicine so that it, it's one unit and it can't be used any other way? Yeah. Or was the manufacture of that too difficult? No, it isn't at all. In fact, we've got at the moment nine, nine versions of this being um, going through prototyping and, and for trial in April next year. Um, and they, some are self-assembled already, and all you have to do is just click them down um, a fraction of an inch, and that pierces the bottle. Sterility, obviously, we've got to maintain as long as possible, um, just like you know, normal practice. So, no, and the world, the world is so open. That's why I showed the other diverse um, shapes. We can brand them to different shapes for companies. Um, they can be categorized into you know, pediatric and et cetera, et cetera. And we've coded, we've got a load of IP on the way that we, um, that we put the needle on as well so that um, we can make sure that only the right needle goes onto the right bottle using shapes and, and a key, if you like. So thank you for the question. My name is Matthew. I live in uh, uh, Palo Alto. Um, I'm a practicing physician who also does work in global health and um, disaster management. Um, so on the one hand, I'm so thrilled. I want them. I have a team going to Bangladesh uh, this week. I have one to Kenya. I want how, how fast can I get them is the one question. But I also wonder when you're in approaches with these governments and other things on how to change the way the rules are are, are done about single-use syringes. Is there a consideration for places that do have the means to sterilize and do sterilize well? I. I I have a concern that some places will be punished for their need to now get a new device, whereas they were not the ones having a problem. Um, there is no, no sterilization allowed now on products, mainly because the sterilization system that was around in the um, 70s and 80s is so broken that you can't guarantee that it really is sterilized by the time the process has taken place. So, and, and they're so cheap, a syringe is under five cents and it would cost more to sterilize it. So unfortunately, it becomes um, a throwaway product. They should all be burnt at 800 degrees, and the plastics we use are no dioxins, no sulfur, blah, blah, blah. So. I'm with you. Thank you. And Nico, I have a question for you as well. Thanks. So you gave an example. Um, as someone who's lost three friends to the opioid crisis, and I think we all, as a physician, have, have seen what it's, how it's destroying communities, um, th there are almost three times as many people dying as did during the AIDS crisis at the height of it. Right. Um, you showed, showed a pill that showed a uh, fake Xanax, and it said 2.5 milligrams of fentanyl and 7.5 milligrams of escitalopram, which was like the synthetic Xanax. I can conceive of no reason whatsoever anyone would ever put so high a dose of fentanyl, which usually is done in micrograms, into that unless they were trying to kill people. Is there a force that is providing this? Well, I think... One consideration is um, a lot of this is backyard chemistry, and w there's a sense that some of them are mistakes, right? We don't have the typical procedures we would have for the production of, of, of drugs, of food um, happening in some of these laboratories or their repurposed uh, counterfeit pill presses. Some potential explanations are for transportation, uh, right? So getting a, a certain concentration in that was then meant to be diluted and bound. Um, uh, but you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily attribute it to, to, to design. I think there's a, uh, experimentation taking place, there's innovation, debatably, and uh, I think the important thing is to uh, instrument these systems to understand how someone who's perhaps denied care at a clinic might substitute or uh, you know, seek other uh, sources uh, for their drugs, and then better sense as a community of what's in those drugs. We have a desperate need for testing these things, for uh, consumer tests, uh, for festivals, for wherever people are exposed to, to drug use to ascertain whether they're lethal doses. I think we have time for one last question. Um, the lady in the front, tell us your name and where you're from. I'm Yixiang Liu from Texas, a 911 pain management and board certified anesthesiologist. So uh, needles and narcs are my daily uh, things. Uh, I wonder, I uh, remember one uh, presentation used needles in the capsule that can be reabsorbed in the GI tract. Is there any, uh, any directions on research uh, on uh, reabsorbable needles? 
absorbable needles. Well, there has been some technology which actually that pill utilizes in sugar needles. So there were devices made and trialed in the UK where you, you insert a little splinter of sugar, which was stabilizing the drug as well. So it was out of the cold chain, and it, this dissolved in the intradermal layer. Um, I don't know the status of it right now, but you know, obviously there's, there's room for, for uh, depending on the market, there's room for lots of different um, technologies to come forward. So unfortunately, we, uh, we've uh, come to the end of this particular session, but it's not all about what you saw on Breaking Bad. <laughs> Dr. Nick, Dr. Nico Preston, thank you so much for your insight. We'll be around during uh, the break or to, towards the conclusion of today. But a big thanks to you for coming in from Boston. Mark Koska, thanks for coming in from London. My name is Ralph Simon, and thank you so much, giving you some insight into the democratization of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you.